<laughs> yeah. Uh, just uh, for a reminder for for you again, good to see you this morning. I've already said that to you, but uh, since we're on air, I have to make it look like I was sincere. So, <laughs> I still have some more copies of uh, Tribulation Believers versus Church Age Believers comparisons here. Church is not going into the Tribulation period. Totally different for us. I've got another section of study on the difference between law and grace and what that has to do with, with the coming of the prophecy of the rapture and lots of studies on that. But anyway, since that's been... Uh, going around the, making its circuit again like a, a plague or a bad flu that goes around seasonally. That's where a lot of false teaching goes around. It's like a seasonal thing. It picks up a little steam in certain regions, certain areas, and sometimes now today it gets a lot of clicks and it becomes something that becomes, well, you know, I think that's probably true because people don't know the Bible well enough to know whether it's true or not, so they need to go to a Bible teaching church where they can find out. They won't do it because they want to be entertained. Simple-minded people want to be entertained. Martha's will never be Mary's, and Mary's will never be Martha's. And I've only had a half a cup of coffee this morning. So <laughs> Tribulation believers versus church-age believers. Anyway, that's uh, pick it up, a copy if you didn't have one. It's just a little bit of it, but there's a lot more there. You need the Mary's and the Martha's. You need both. It's just harder to convert one than it is the other. We need to be workers in the work of God, not just you know people who just swell in knowledge and never use it. I'm not saying you don't because I'm sure you do. We had some notes left over from Second uh, Peter, and we're going to finish those up. But we covered Second Peter chapter two, verses one through three in our Wednesday night service and so we looked at part of that study that night uh, Wednesday night and some of the points that we looked at uh, positive believers I've really got a small font on that but we do have notes on that if somebody needs a copy positive believers must not be silent in the face of false prophets. We looked at those verses of Scripture there, those particular passages. Uh, they prophesy of a different outcome than God prophesied, whether that was historically with Israel. When the prophets said, Judgment's coming if you don't change your ways. Well, the, a lot of the prophets were killed for telling the kings what they did. kings of Israel didn't want to hear. And some of them were uh, imprisoned. Uh, others, other things were done to them. Some of them were spit on. Some of them were, um, Isaiah was sawn in asunder by being put in a hollow log and cut in half. Uh, they set prophets on fire. These were the Jewish people, what they did to their own Jewish prophets. They'd rather listen to the po politics of their kings and have the false illusion that they were all that in a bag of chips when they were just empty bags. God is the chip. They prophesied a different outcome than God prophesied. The rapture is going to happen. There are false prophets that say it's not. The second coming of Christ is going to happen. The Antichrist is going to be revealed in the tribulation period and people are going to believe his lies and be judged by God because of it. That's going to happen. God said it will. It's going to happen. But they also offer a different hope. They believe they're saving themselves by saving others. As the former mayor of New York Bloomfield, I think his name said, has his own news agency and his own magazine, uh, said that uh, he gave to so many charities that he knew there was no way he wasn't getting into heaven because he was so benevolent. So that's a false prophecy. I hope where there is none, there is a false prophecy that there's no consequences to sin. I'm not going to reap what I'm going to sow. And that's picked up into the churches today. And some of them are the Protestant churches, not I'm not picking on Catholic church, but I'm saying a lot of the Protestant churches now are embracing abominations even into their pulpits and into their seminaries as educators. This John Shelby being one of them. Bone. Of course, he's of the past, but he's educated people to be more liberal than he is uh, in their 
if you want to call it a denomination. So they offer a hope where there is none. They offer a gospel that God did not give. They believe that with sin, it makes no difference. You're supposed to be all-inclusive and accept everybody. And Jesus doesn't. Hell, heaven's not the one to accept everybody. You've got to be saved. And if you're saved, you're, not, you're supposed to live like you're saved. Most false prophets are greedy for gain. You don't have, I don't want to tell you about those types that you see on TV, and they're not just TV preachers. Uh, they're reckless with other people's lives. False prophets are. They're reckless with other people's lives. They don't care that they're hurting you in order to step on you to get to where they want. And there's preachers like that too. They don't care if they step on to get what they want. Believers should not want these men to be eternally judged, obviously, because Christ, Christ died for them all. You want them to be saved. So you don't hate the sinner, you hate the sin. The name of Jesus brings out the evil thoughts men have for God. We brought that out from 2 Peter chapter 2. There's going to be swift destruction. They bring out evil heresies, verse 1 says. And they follow pernicious evil ways. The word poneros means evil in verse 2 of 2 Peter 2. And they will speak evil of the way of truth. That's another name for Jesus Christ. It's a synonym for Christ. And those who are His followers. I don't talk about people who go to church. Going to church does not make us a follower of Jesus Christ. Following Jesus Christ's word. Jesus says, My sheep hear My voice and they know My name and they follow Me. Another shepherd, another voice, they will not hear. They will not follow. People just follow around now to find a church that has the biggest band. I don't care. It's all right if you've got both. You want to have both, that's fine. But I rarely ever hear anybody say, I go to such and such church because the teaching of the Word of God is so intense. It's helping me become a better Christian, a better husband, a better wife, a better son or daughter. When you hear advertisements in the paper and online, most of the time it's not for the body of Christ to come in to be built up in the faith. It's the truth. And I keep harping on it. Paul, there were things that Paul and Peter kept harping on all the time that was a problem in their day. Trying to get through to somebody who still had some sort of a signal between their soul and spirit and the throne of God. The name of Jesus brings out evil thoughts men have for God. And the word pushes mankind to show his true intentions. Hebrews 4.12 The word of God is living. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Pierces under the sunder of the soul and the spirit. And of the joints and the marrow. It's a critic, a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our heart. And a lot of people, when their intent of their heart is exposed within their conscience in a church service... They feel uncomfortable. It's because they've been using wrong-headed thinking. They've been selfish. They haven't been doctrinally correct. And they're not going to be corrected. And they're not going to stay. And they will bring their children in. And then if they don't have what they want for their children, they'll throw their children onto the bus, use them as human shields, and use the fact that you don't have a great children's program in order to leave the church. What hypocrites! They are the ones that don't want the Word. The children that were here before, they love the Word. They love their teachers. I've got personal notes written by those children still in my desk today. The parents didn't want the Word of God. The parents were the problem, not the kids. They were on negative volition to Bible doctrine, and they weren't about to have the Word of God as a discerner and a critic of their thoughts that was given them ideas and giving them the ability to see a light that they hadn't seen before. As our former pastor used to say for most believers, this is the last stop before going back into apostasy, going back to the leeks and the garlics and the onions and the pomegranates of Egypt. What Israel wanted when they finally got out and they were being tested by the Lord in their spirit and soul in the desert and they didn't like that desert testing. They didn't like being made stronger. They didn't like the crucible of becoming a mature Christian. It is not meant to be easy. But the grace of God will support you to make you a strong Christian. The weak Christians do not serve on the front line. Very few of them will serve in reserve. They like to wear the uniform but they don't want to 
hone their skills. No more coffee. <laughs> if you do not wish to be repulsive to society, don't stand up for Jesus Christ. We brought that out. And you don't want to be repulsive. You don't want to look repulsive. You don't want to sound repulsive. You don't want to sound vulgar. Vulgar, no, word vulgar is an old word. Vulgar does not, did not always mean something dirty, but it meant something that was very base, very plain, very dirt floor cavendish, but not foul mouth or foul behavior. Or just crude, the word vulgar just used to mean very simple language. We don't want to come across as being simpletons. But when you stand up for Christ, especially in our society today, it, it's very repulsive. Verse 3 says, and through covetousness, because you're not bringing gain to them, with feigned words, we brought that out, they make merchandise, they slander you. They'll slander you. And so we'll pick up on a few things this morning. And uh, false teachers use fair speech to gain a following so they may profit from you. Fair gain of you. Resident truth is the only antidote that can stop the virus of false teaching. Okay, God. Oh, come on now. We press hard on making two copies. This is the new one. All right. Come on. Maybe it's not the new one. And here we go. That's a believer. Amen. So, the word comes to the brain. You think? That's G N O S I S or facts. That's what equals facts. Bible facts. We're talking about Bible facts. God's word comes to the believer's soul through Bible study. Comes to the brain. That's what facts is, and then it gets down to the soul. But it doesn't go to the soul next. It goes. Uh, you've got to be positive to get the word. So we have uh, reception. Reception then takes place here in the human spirit, where his spirit bears witness with your spirit. Romans 8, 16, I think it is. 2 Corinthians 2, 12. So you get reception from, the, from your soul and your brain and your academics kicks in. This is called epinosis or a higher, higher law. It's a prefix preposition. It's not an I like that. Epinosis, a prefix preposition. That's epinosis. That's spiritual knowledge. That's spiritual knowledge. <coughs> That's where your conscience, which is your norms and standards. That's not Norfolk and Southern Railway, Cindy. <laughs> Human spirit, it's epinosis, it's spiritual knowledge. It, it creates your conscience. It's also known as the new man. That's what that is. We're a new man, we're a new creation in Christ. And when that new heart, that new conscience is created... Then it circles back to the soul, which is mentality. Conscience. That's your standards of right and wrong. Self-consciousness, C-O-N-S-C-I-O-U-S, -S consciousness. And then you have emotion. and your human will. This is your soul. This is one, two, three, four, five, which is the number of grace. Grace is the number five numerically in biblical numerology. And this is how you're made in the image of God. Mentality, the ability to rationalize, conscious, to have 
standards of right and wrong. That's where your righteousness versus God's righteousness is challenged after you have an old sin nature involved. Self-consciousness, self-awareness, something the animal kingdom does not have. Emotion and will. And then, of course, the sixth element is the O as in acquired through Adam, via Adam. Romans, some of you can't see this. This is Romans 5 and verse 12. Old sin nature acquired through Adam. Not by God, but by Adam. It's our fault. We sin. It's not God's fault. But you take this knowledge that comes into your soul and you cycle it back and you use it in your, your life. There's a bunch of little things there, a lot of nuances that I did not put in there. But you learn and you grow. And as you learn and you grow, there's a process to knowledge. It's a process to you being able to remember things. Some people remember a little faster than others. Some people are a little slower on the tape. We get that. It's just life. I was always a little slow, but once it stuck, it stuck. And I was either really right or I was either really wrong. But my, con- my self-consciousness says I was 100% spot on. <laughs> and I was spot on wrong or spot on right. I'm a little slow. But I'm not stupid. And I see things. And I don't like some things I see. I don't like some things I hear. And you don't either sometimes. And the flow of the Word of God is how we get to where we want to be. But God gave instructions regarding prophets. And I'm going to ask you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18, uh, just for a moment. Deuteros, it's the second reading of the law before Moses was conveniently planted by God somewhere. And Joshua took over after him. Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the old of the of the, of the Torah. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. Page 237 in my Bible. <laughs> I think that's Deuteronomy. Is that what I said? 18 verse 52, excuse me. 238 page. Deuteronomy 18 verse 15. The Lord thy God shall raise up thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me, and him ye shall hearken. According to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see his, this great fire any more that I die not. And the Lord <coughs> said unto me, They were well spoken that which they have spoken. And I will raise them up a prophet among their brethren like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I command him to say. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words which he shall speak in my name, I will hold him accountable for it. But the prophet who shall presume to speak a word in my name which I have not committed, commanded him to speak, or who shall speak in the name of another God, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the... The Lord hath not spoken. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that it is the thing upon which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet spoke it presumptuously as though he was speaking in the name of the Lord. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. So that was an important thing. False teachers who say they speak the word of the Lord, which is not the word of God, are not new. Jeremiah 5.31, Ezekiel 13 and verse 6 uh, claims the same. And they were not new in Peter's day either. They weren't new in that day either. From Deuteronomy 18.55-22, God tells His people how to identify a false teacher, a false prophet, and what to do with him. Now, we can't do what they did with him back in the day or stone him to death. We can't do that, but we can call them out. Church has got so where it's so insecure about its mission of being a witness for Christ, it has now assumed that it has a responsibility of just being friends with the world. Jesus was not a friend of the world. 
He never was a friend of the world. He was a friend only to those who were friendly with the Word of God and those who were fond of the Word of God. He wasn't a friend of the world. We always have the assumption that we're supposed to be friendly. Your first responsibility is to be a witness. That's my first responsibility. Not to be mean, but to be a witness. And that's why we're commanded by God to be separate from evil and wickedness. We're commanded to be separated from sin in our own personal lives. Somebody says they're speaking for God. What they say is to line up with the Bible. And also their words must be aligned in context in which that word of God was delivered. That's another part. Because you can take Scripture, Satan can take Scripture and quote it out of context all day long. And then you can find yourself coming under the thumb of certain denominations that teach that you've got to keep working to keep your salvation or you might lose it. They'll go to such passages as Matthew chapter... Never use Matthew 24 and 25 in context of the church because it has absolutely nothing to do with the church. And chapters 24 and 25 of the book of Matthew are used all the time as a context for what Christians should expect to look for. It is not in your purview. It's not in the calendar of the church. The rapture is in the calendar of the church. We're not to be looking for signs. We're not supposed to be looking for signs. We're supposed to be looking for the Savior. But we're weak of faith, so we've got to have a sign. We've got to throw out the fleece like Gideon did and make sure that it, it shows us something. It's a lack of faith. I'm not encouraged by somebody finding an old piece of wood at Mount Tibet and saying, oh, that must have come off the ark. It must be real. Of course it's real. The Bible says it is. Somebody found a rock on the moon. Oh, my word. Just believe. Just believe it. But I'm too smart to believe it. No, you're too arrogant to not believe it. I'm too arrogant to not believe it. I gotta have I get biblical archaeology. I used to, I stopped the, the subscription. I stopped the prescription. I stopped it. Because they were constantly trying to defend secularism versus theology. And I just I just dropped them. The word that you take from the Scripture, because the Bible, I'll be getting back to Matthew chapter 24, I think it's verse 13, those that endure to the end shall be saved. Context there has to do with those who physically survive the tribulation period will be physically preserved to going into the millennial kingdom. Otherwise, they're still saved if they put their faith in Christ. But it has nothing to do with you and me doing good until the last day or we're going to lose our salvation. It has nothing to do with that. And turning and pruning hooks and to, uh, swords and the pruning hooks and, and the spears and the plowshares. That's a millennial kingdom passage of no war. The World Council of Churches uses that all the time. It has nothing to do with the church age. It's all used in the, in the ruse of disarming armed people to defend themselves. But you can use Scripture out of context, I can too, for a multitude of goals. And one of the most disappointing things that ever happens to me in the ministry is when I've been using a passage of Scripture incorrectly. And it finally dawns on me, I can't use it no more. It doesn't apply. But it's part of growth. This is how liberation theology was started and is being perpetuated by taking Scripture out of context and applying it to today's age. Of taking Scripture out of context that has to do with Jesus reigning on the earth during the Millennial Kingdom and all that comes with that. And applying it to how your theology should be instructed and fed to your churches now in a non-millennial point of view. It changes your evangelism. It changes your emphasis. It changes your desire for the future. And your whole hope for the future is based upon works not upon true biblical exegesis. That's how liberation theology was started. It started out uh, through the Catholic Church in, in South America primarily. So I always said I'm glad that uh, Columbus did not discover North American continent because it had been claimed by Spain and we'd all been Catholics, Roman Catholics. And we would be like South America run by priests and governments, both corrupt. Both thinking they're righteous because their goal is that they're going to create a society by their own efforts and that God will be pleased with them. But that's how liberation theology was started and is perpetuated. The World Council of Churches' signature scripture for world peace is based on millennial kingdom promise. 
But in the normal progression of a pastor's growth, he's going to adjust his take on non-essential doctrines from time to time. Why are you bringing that out? Because we're talking about the teachings. There's false teachers, and then there's correct teaching, and then there's just wrong-headed thinking at times. Part of maturing. No one is a perfect teacher of the Word of God. But there are false teachers who do it on purpose. And then there's people who are still learning. That's why all pastors are not to, all pastors are not to be young men. It's prohibited. And First Timothy chapter three, it is prohibited that you put a. I don't care if he's finished with seminary. It's prohibited to put a young man. A young man considered biblically as a man that's less than forty years of age. It's prohibited to put him as a pastor of a church, head pastor of a church. He's a new old futon. He's easily deceived. He's a tender plant that's easily moved by peer pressure, and he's easily to move by self uh, uh, rising of self. Self exaltation. Satan knows how to manipulate the immature person. Doesn't mean he's not smart, but he's immature. No one is a perfect teacher of the word. All pastors from time to time may take an enlightened approach to non essential teachings or doctrines to the faith. Non essential, I said. I'll give you an example from Acts 18 24 through 26. Aquila and Priscilla, man and his wife who were godly people who had been taught by Paul, they had to correct Apollos, who was apparently another another apostle, because not everybody... There were more than 12 apostles. Good, let's just get that straight. There were more than 12 apostles, but there were the 12. Those other 12 didn't write... All the 12 apostles didn't write Scripture either. But they had a commission that was direct, but there were other apostles that were given the gift of apostleship. There weren't just 12 men going out healing people, sharing the gospel, setting up churches. There were those who were in particular that we know of, and these were the primaries in the, in the uh, general epistles and the Pauline, of course, in the book of Acts. But Apollos had an error concerning baptism, and he was teaching it wrong. And This man and this woman, this good godly Christian man and his woman, helped him to see that the way he was preaching it was a different baptism than what Paul intended it to be. They weren't baptizing people, talking about baptizing people into the kingdom of God anymore because that was past. That was, that's, that's done. You've got to get the millennium in first. Now, it was a different kind of baptism that Apollos should have been teaching. So he was corrected in a good way. Acts 18, 24 through 26. They had to correct him. And I'm sure they did it in a godly way because he would have gone off some church member telling him what to do. But this is a normal progression of learning more as the Word of God is presented. That's how we learn. A pastor's approach may then be less intense or it may be more intense depending on the pastor's previous understanding. Some people get scared if their pastor changes his stance on something. So you've got to define it. You've got to explain it to me, Lucy. This is also why an examination into the beliefs of a pastoral candidate is held before the man is installed and ordained. I had a friend that I went to Piedmont Bible College with, which is now Carolina University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And he sat next to me. They were good friends. Him, He and his wife and me and my wife, we were good friends with them, our daughter and their dog. And the he was already ordained from the Southern Baptist Convention. He was younger than me, just right fresh out of high school. He was a he was a rainbow. He sold rainbow uh, brand uh, vacuum cleaners. That's how he made money uh, while he to get through school. But he was ordained, had the picture and everything, and had the ordination. I didn't get ordained until I was forty seven years old, and I'd been called to the ministry when I was twenty three. Talking about testing, twenty seven years of waiting. 20, uh, four years of waiting. Not only is your beliefs available, but you learn and you grow within the teaching of, of the Word of God. Maturity is underrated. Maturity for the man of God cannot be overrated, overemphasized. It's significant 
because most of the people that you're going to pastor are, are going to challenge you on a lot of things, whether it's Bible, character, motivation. You're going to get challenged on a lot of different avenues that Bible is not going to give you the answer to. You've got to have enough wisdom of concepts and precepts from the Scripture to formulate what you th hope is a right answer. Because people, some people listen. <laughs> You've got to know the fundamentals of faith, fundamentals of faith thoroughly, and you have to have maturity in dealing with the different age, group, age groups in your church as well. Martin Luther is thought of by many theologians as the father of the Protestant Reformation. We all know that. And his passion at times, well, it needed curbing. Sometimes uh, in his earlier years, uh, his passion needed to be curbed with the breaks of reason. And he had a close friend, uh, German theologian uh, Philip Macathlon. And he helped Luther to get the rough edges taken care of. So he instilled a credo of life in Martin Luther. And the quote is, and some of you have heard it before, in essentials, unity. The fundamentals of the faith, unity. In essentials, you've got to be unified. You can't be like this guy and say none of the Bible theolo theologically fundamental is, is off. You've got to have unity. So in essentials, <coughs> unity. In non-essentials, liberty. If you don't believe in the tribulation period, that's not a fundamental of the faith. It's not a fundamental of the faith. You still have fellowship. You don't believe in certain things. Women deacons. Well, that's still that's not a reason to fall out over it. Or not fall out of it. You don't believe that there should be a marriage for anybody, for remarriage for a Christian if their spouse is still alive. That's no reason to fall out. <clears throat> Immature people fall out over those type of things all the time. That's no reason to fall out. There's so many other things that you come to learn and use as, you, as the Word of God marinates in your thinking, it gives you wisdom. That's why the pastor needs to spend most of his time on his rear end in his desk studying the Word of God so that he has that wisdom. Some of you are never need it, but some people need it all the time. And essentials unity and non-essentials liberty. Somebody comes to me with an issue that's just balling the the devil out of me and they're trying to poke me and probably take action, take action, take action, take action. I'm more or less likely to take action against whatever they want me to take action against and take action against them. Because I can't be pushed into a corner. I can't be prodded. I can't be handled. Because if I did, then every one of you can handle me. And I will tell you this, the pastor has to be the biggest ass in the church sometimes. Just to be honest, people not need to get out from underneath their cloaks of self-righteousness and be honest about it. You've got to be tough. But none of y'all better call me that. <laughs> I wouldn't call you that. <laughs> Jeremiah put it in a different way. See that Jeremiah said, said the, the pastor, the shepherd of the, of the flock of, of Israel had to have a forehead like flint. He had to be a hard head. Sorry, a hard case, whatever. Use whatever uh, you, you want to use there. But in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, though, charity. Unconditional love. And that's a good rule. And In all things, unity. In essentials, unity. Yes. There are a lot of churches in the county that we have unity with in that regard. Differences in certain things, but unity in that and, and the But there are some that we have... No, we will not have an ecclesiastical arrangement with. And when there are other churches, even of our denomination, that will have an ecclesiastical vacation Bible school, joint school, they're having a joint school with leaven. Blatant leaven. That is not biblical separation. And a lot of Christians don't like the doctrine of biblical separation. But the Bible specifically teaches it. Because when the pernicious come in and try to start teaching their lies, they're not going to come in bold and, 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 and uh, advertise it. It will not be advertised. You've got to look into them. You've got to look into the people that you're going to make an alliance with. 
False teachers are different. They have a different vivende, different modus operandi. Uh, their motivation is different, and they have a different way of doing things. And as the Bible says, they bring in destructive heresies, and they're very sneaky about how they are doing it. They are very cunning. It's not about unity for them. It's about bringing you down. For a lot of people, we we can only have unity if you agree with me. Well, why don't we look at it this way? You can only have unity if you agree with me. That's where you have to make your stand when it comes to the teaching of the Word of God. And a lot of times we don't want to do that because people just feel like, that's too divisive. I'd rather be divided by doctrine than united by heresy. Adrian Rogers, that firebrand preacher once said... But anyway, let's go on. Let's be kind. As George Bush said, a kinder, gentler nation. All right. The motivations of a false teacher are much different than that of an untaught teacher. False teachers. Now I'm bringing this out because it's a follow-up on our verses 1 through 3 of last time. Of these false teachers, how they secretly come in among you. They bring destructive teachings. They deny the Lord, that is the deity of Christ. Uh, They deny... All these things, the fundamentals of the faith. By denying the Lord, you're denying the fundamentals of the faith, of who Christ is, what redemption is, what the atonement is, what the resurrection means. It means nothing to these people. It's just a season of wearing a different robe and a different sash, of using a different part of the prayer manual. I have the Episcopal prayer book, and everything is there seasonally laid out, and it runs across there are prayer books for a lot of different denominations and there are the responsive readings that are expected between the worship leader and the congregation. So some people just eat that up because they are ecclesiastical in mindset. Ecclesiasticism is not relationship oriented. It's corporate oriented. It's business oriented. It is following the roots. It is code oriented. It is never conscience oriented. And it takes maturity to see that. And I always hold on because I'm thinking some people will just not wait long enough to get mature. They want to get mature fast. And it does not happen. There are no microwave mature Christians. We're all slow bait. This is not a sprint. It's a marathon. They don't take the military on their crucible at the end of basic training the first week they're in there. (laughs) Talking about, uh, uh, what we used to call it, not the paddy wagon, that's what they took down to Fayetteville to pick up the troublemakers on a Friday and Saturday night. The NPs would be down there with the paddy wagon and picking them up. Back in the day when it was not a good place to be. But there would be the Red Cross, the the ambulance following you with the the corpsman. They'd be following the the long crucible if you're on the 26-mile mark with the full pack and everything, and it was all day. You, you stopped, just, you carried your own canteen, you had to get back to where you had to be, and it was one of the last things that you did as a part of your testing at the end of boot. They didn't do that the first few weeks. You, they were built up for it. They were built up for it. You didn't go to record fire until you got the last couple of weeks because you had to have practice, and you had practice and practice and practice. Same thing with the MOS, your military occupational skill. You were you trained and trained and trained and trained. You didn't start getting much testing until you got half, two thirds way through that, and then it became more critical that you knew more about your skill set, and you were tested, 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 tested on it, whatever it might be. It takes time. Now, they don't have it so much time, but for Christianity, it takes a long time sometimes. False teachers, as Peter brought out there, uh, the word is pseudo, our word for false, like a pseudonym, a false name. And the word teachers, didasku, or they are instructors. Peter warns us false teachers are different, and their motivation is different than someone who is simply untaught, who's just trying to instruct others. There are a lot of pastors and churches that are untaught and they're trying to do the best they can and they can miss it sometimes. Have the wrong resource that they're using uh, for their guidance. It can happen. Or taught wrong and didn't get time to, to learn more. It can happen to anybody. And it can happen to somebody who's been in the ministry a long time. That's why you've got to stay in the Word. You just can't quit learning because you've got a stockpile full of files and sermons. 
the false teachers, uh, they won't boldly claim their intentions up front, at least at first. So they privately or privately or secretly bring their destructive heresies in, as verse 1 of chapter 2 says, who privately or secretly bring in their destructive heresies. And when they bring them in, the word bring in, in verse, right in the middle of verse 1 of chapter 2 of Second Peter, par I say go, and par I say go, it's a prefix preposition, par along the side of, and I say go means uh, to bring in. So what they do is that they introduce those things alongside of truth. We believe, there are those who believe that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. But there are those who at the same time will say that, that his soul separated from his spirit before he ever went to the cross. There's a deist. You'll have some who will say that that wasn't even Jesus who went to the cross. It was another person because God can't die. Well, they don't know Hebrews chapter 2 verse 7 says that God came to die. Jesus became human form so that he could die because God can't through human flesh. But the false teachers always start off with a little bit of truth and then they start slipping in a little bit of error. And as we always say, the best way to detect error is by knowing as much truth as you possibly can. People who work in the espionage field, when someone has tried to learn our language or we have tried to learn their language, they can tell how well you are in phraseology. They can tell how well you use your pronouns, your verbs. They can tell how well now you put a sentence structure together. The experts can. And they can tell if you are a phony. They can tell if your phrenology or your morphology is wrong and your pronunciation. They can tell if you're speaking from the wrong part of your mouth, it's glottal, or it's from the denture area. They can tell these little things that are common to their own countrymen when you try to pose as one of their countrymen. So they, these people who go into espionage and double agents, they will practice and practice and practice with people of that country, and they will drill them and drill them and drill them because your life and your mission is on the line if you mess up. Knowing the truth helps you detect error. And the Bible should be known better by Christians than anybody else. I dare say Muslims know the Quran better than most Christians know the Scriptures. They're always quoting the Quran, or Quran as some down south say. The reason false teachers and false movements take hold in the heads and the hearts and the homes and the churches and the nation is because people are just ignorant of the Scripture. They have an idea. They know a little bit about it. But it's like the guy that's gone to the Bruce Lee movie and he comes out on the street there uh, and he thinks he can whip anybody's rear end because he knows how to do a kick or something or a fist punch. Just enough to get hurt. It stands to reason that the unsaved of this, this world would want to limit, if not completely eliminate, the Bible and society altogether. But they do not. They use the Bible because it is the best weapon to use against the church. It's a shame, but the Bible is the best weapon to use against the church today. Because so many erroneous and ignorant beliefs. The unsaved disagree with what the Bible says we must do, though. You know that happens. How we ought to live as a family, how to be married, how we ought to think about our freedom, how we ought to believe about things. The unsaved disagree with that. But I'm going to tell you a lot of Christians will disagree with the Bible believing believer, too. Oh, my word. And so that void that they have in their heart for the knowledge is filled with lies. Truth helps keep the lies at a, at a medium roar, as we like to say. Keeps it down anyway. It'll still pop up, you know that. But the unsaved, they don't agree with the Bible most for the most part. And some of them want it removed from society altogether, you know that. That's Psalm 2, 1 through 3. And the Old Testament, the prophet Amos, in chapter 7, verses 10 through 13. They didn't want to hear what Amos had to say. They said that Amos was the problem. That the prophecy of coming judgment by the Assyrians was never going to happen. 721 B.C. did happen. It was brutal. They filleted the citizens and hung them up in the streets and left the flesh hanging off of them. Skin hanging down to the ground where the dogs would come in and help try to pull the bodies off 
apart even more. They would bring their dogs in, these mastiffs. They would come in and they would string the people up as examples. And as soon as the people's hearts sank, they gave in and they carried a wad of these people off to the north and to, and to Nineveh. They carried a lot of them off. And some of them, they stayed there with them. They were cruel. Amos gave the prophecy that it would happen if the people didn't repent. The trouble, however, is that when the Bible is removed from our hearts, our homes, and our society, there's a large vacuum that's got to be filled. Being filled with social media and foolishness now. And false teaching. There's a large vacuum in the soul that's going to get filled if the standard of good morality and truth is not established. And the earlier you can establish it in the children, the better off you are. Children need to hear the truth so they can detect lie and error and wickedness. But when parents don't even recognize it, God help us. We only have children for a short time. Parents have got to have them all day long. And they're going to be answering for me. And so will I for the way I raise my children. And I hope I did a decent job. Without the word of the Lord, there is no saving gospel. No spiritual preservation for the saved. That's the way it is. I won't get done. It's sad enough when the unsaved push the word of God to the side. I can remember years ago before, what is it called, the blue laws? You didn't have businesses open except the essential emergency. And then after those were repealed, you had everybody, all their business were open and everything. It was, But back then, you know, people kind of hung out around the house, did their thing. If they didn't have work to do, at least they'd sit on the porch, talk with one another, go fishing. If they didn't want to go to church, they did something. But more people went to church back then. But it's sad when the unsaved push the Word of God to the side. But it's even more sad when the church pushes the Word of God to the side. When the believer pushes the Word of God to the side for something else. The word heresy there, hiresis, H-A-I-R-E-S-I-S, heresies, it means something that is chosen, as we said. Uh, It is something that somebody chooses contrary to established truth. That's what heresy is. It is that which is contrary to fundamental standards. Men marrying men men, and women marrying women is contrary to fundamental human standards. That's a heresy. It's heresy. It's not only debauchery, it's heresy. The doctrine is established in the written Word of God. That's the standard. So, you've got it in your notes, I imagine. Heresies are self-opinions which challenge the Word of God. Again, Psalm 2, 1 through 3. They want to decouple from God. People want to. They vote for leaders who want to. And eventually those leaders write laws. That's what legislation does. It writes laws. And the House, and then they see how their constituents feel about it back home. Uh, And some of them they listen to them, some of them they don't. And then the Senate has to pass the bill in order to be brought forward to be signed into law. Heresies are opinions, self-opinions that weigh are weighed into one's thoughts concerning truth. I don't feel that way about that anymore. I don't feel that. I'm talking about going away from the Word of God. Our pastor before had a friend he went through college with, and they were both students of the Word. Went through five years for the bachelor's program. It was a five-year program at the time. I mean, a full load. wasn't four years. It was a five-year for that. Bachelor of Theology program, not four years. It's five years for that. That's why typically when men finish the ministry, they've got their training is usually close to 200 hours, semester hours. But he had a good friend that he went to college with, and I guess maybe the family was friends too. And the friend was in North Carolina, invited him to come and, and visit with him. Well, his friend had given up on the fundamentals of faith and become a full-blown Pentecostal speaking in tongues, going all the healing and all this other stuff. And it just shocked him to no end. He couldn't wait to get out of there and get back home. And that little uh, rambler that he drove. That little rambler, I think. But people who get their self-opinions, they weigh their opinions against the Word of God and say, I'm not, I, I'm not going to go with that. People, Peter says these are destructive choices. 
our personal opinions when they go against the Bible are destructive. When it comes to God's Word, only God has the absolute authority. And that's and, and it's only for the good of mankind. And selfishly, we can't see what's the good of mankind because we just want what's good for us. The Word chaffs the soul of the negative believer. It irritates the, 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 the self-respect that the lost person has and the respect they have for their human good. The Word of God says we are to submit to God's will and heresy says we are to have an alternative that is better. As this joker uh, said, verses 2, pages 2 and 3, it's in here somewhere. I'm a Christian. 45 years I served the Christian church as a deacon, a priest, and a bishop. I continue to serve that church today in a wide variety of ways. But I look forward to my official retirement. I believe God is real. I live deeply and significantly as one related to that divine reality. I call Jesus my Lord. I believe that He has mediated God in a powerful and unique way to human history and to me. I believe that my particular life has been dramatically and decisively impacted not only by the life of this Jesus, but also by His death and indeed by the Easter experience that Christians now know as the resurrection. Part of my life's vocation has been spent seeking a way to articulate this impact and to invite others into what I can only call the Christ experience. I believe that in this Christ I discovered a basis for meaning, for ethics, for prayer, for worship, and even for the hope of life beyond the boundaries of my mortality. I want my readers to know who it is that writes these words. I do not want to be guilty of violating any truth and packaging in a, in a truth, any truth, violating any truth in packaging act. I define myself first and foremost as a Christian believer. But he goes on to say, I do not believe that the Bible is the Word of God in any literal sense. I do not believe that homosexual people are abnormal, mentally sick, or morally depraved. Further, I regard any sacred text that suggests otherwise to be both wrong and ill informed. I do not believe that this Jesus did in any literal way raise from the dead. I do not believe He enabled one who was mute and profoundly deaf since birth to hear or speak. I do not believe that Jesus entered this world by the miracle of the virgin birth. I do not believe that Jesus at the end of His early sojourn returned to God by sending in any literal sense into a heaven located somewhere above the sky. I do not believe that this Jesus founded a church or that he established an ecclesiastical hierarchy beginning with the twelve apostles. I do not believe that any human being is born in sin and that unless baptized or somehow saved, they're forever banished from God's presence. This man is one of the deans of the Episcopal University in Richmond, Virginia, or was. And so you wonder why you see these badge signs hanging in front of these churches. Anybody want it? Anybody? I don't care what your culture is, what your belief is, what your gender is, whatever it is. We don't care. Come on, come on. I can understand that from that teaching from those priests who run those places. They are heretics. The false teachers' heresy in our text involved denying the Lord that bought their salvation. So does this joker. It hasn't changed. We're going to stop here. I'll finish this off Wednesday. Lord bless you. I've got to quit. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank You for this day, for Your blessings, for the strength that Your Word gives to us. We thank You for the guidance of truth. We love folks, even if we don't agree with them. But Father, they have to be called out as Your Word tells us to to help us to have an understanding so that we protect ourselves from the danger of false teaching. That we insist within our own hearts that we put our projects to the side long enough to learn the Word of God. That we put our pettiness to the side long enough to learn the Word of God so that we can overcome our circumstances. So that we can overcome our pettiness. So that we can overcome the things that... that plague us from our sin nature all the time. Help us to learn that it's important that we grow and that we put Jesus first, not ourselves. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.